на минуту. Вам видно? Да. Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you so much for tuning in. This is Julia Bushkova and her improvised tech supporter, Sandy Haritonov. Uh, before uh, I leave you guys at peace uh, with Julia, uh, first I would like to suggest please subscribe to this channel. Please um, feel free to donate, feel free to support it uh, financially, uh, because I be strongly believe that this is a great free education you can ever find on the topic of violin and violin technique. So that being said, uh, I wish you all a great time together. And Julia, please, your life. Thank you. <clears throat> Hello, everybody. I have to get used to this format that I know that you're there, but I don't, of course, see anybody. So, okay. So, um, today, like the other times, I do not have preset topic. I will be answering your questions. And I will start with the questions that are right now already in the top chat from the top of those questions. Okay. So from uh, Bella Bell, there is a question. Do I have to put all three fingers down at, at the same time to play, uh, for instance, the D note on A string? <clears throat> so I, if I understand correctly, the question is, so this is the D, right? And whether you should put all three fingers there? In my opinion, not at all. Well, it depends. No. I mean, the, fact, the short answer is no. The short answer is train to put one finger. If you're playing one note, play one finger. However, if you're going to be playing, if you're coming to the D from you know, from after you have played B and C sharp, then yes, you can have those on the string. You don't have to erase them to have the D. But if you're just putting an old D, you need to be able to put it there by itself, every finger by itself, you know. So in Shradik, which I recommend, they're a very good exercise. Number one, uh, dexterity, school for violin dexterity, number one. The first position in A major, and I believe that will be number, I think, six, um, when it's all through open string, either five, five or six. But of course, you can do it as slowly as necessary, right? So that teaches <clears throat> to place the finger alone on the string. Next question is from Yu Hong. Um, how much bow hold? Uh, should I give and play in spiccato? Okay, so you mean how much you have to hold the bow, right? Uh, to find a perfect different tight, tight, uh, tightness in the relax. Well, okay, so I assume, Yu Hong, that you're speaking about fast spiccato, um, not slow spiccato, correct? Not which you can completely control anyway, right? But probably something faster. Well, honestly, um, it's you have to find what sounds good. So I wouldn't do anything too tight for when, when the um, bow has to bounce. <clears throat> if it's, um, yeah, not, none of the bouncing bows, you want to grab the bow too tight. But between this, like that is drooping, like this is too light. I mean, I wouldn't have control, you know. It, it, there would be no control. So between this and let's say, Grabbing it on my, by the way, you can also be loose in this position, you know, but you just find the good middle also depends on your bow. It also depends on where, which part of the bow you're in. You know, if you're, if you are playing in here, you will hold a little bit more if you play. Well, I mean, actually, still it depends on, on the tempo. It depends on the tempo. It depends on the speed. So <clears throat> come by, I will look at you. That that is an easy thing because you hold it around here. Um, <clears throat> so let me see. Uh, now, in the absence, well, not in the absence. I actually need to answer a couple more questions that are pre uh, pre said from before. Okay. Sorry, everybody. Okay. So <clears throat> one pre previous uh, question from a subscriber, Peter. 
is you mentioned doing a wrist vibrato video and um, you do not, however, go very much into the movement of the last finger joint and its specific movement. Um, the uh, last joint doesn't easily flex when this person is doing the knocking motion, which is my wrist vibrato, it's this one here. And then you go here. I mean, you actually won't have much of it until you start centering, what I call centering, until you provide some kind of pressure on the string. So in wrist vibrato, we don't do exercises because, so the questionnaire, again, the person who asked the question, Peter, um, he uh, refers Menuhin, Yegudi Menuhin video on left hand, and he seems to do that. Um, I love Yegudi Menuhin. I happen to actually have met him personally, and our whole family was connected to him. So it's fantastic to see him. I must say that, first of all, Yegudi Menuhin, when he gives his exercise, um, he was a natural born player, Yegudi Menuhin was. He was not taught any basics whatsoever. He basically started teaching from how he thought he would have been taught if he were taught by anybody. So he, in that video vibrato, not so much teaches vibrato itself. First of all, he, he's, he's referring always to the arm vibrato. Fine, great. He had wonderful control. I would not teach arm vibrato because I think it doesn't give most people most control. But Igudi Menuhin is one of a kind. One of a kind. So when he was showing certain exercises like the, the caterpillar, you know, this, you know, with these motions on the violin here and there, and then, you know, going around the violin and so forth, eventually he gets into a fantastic system of vibrato that moves you on the violin as well. So the fingers are very relaxed. But just to take it for vibrato itself, I wouldn't. I think it's 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 pretty confusing. Uh, but about the bass, uh, the, the bass notes. Wait a second. Um, anyway, um, <laughs> so he uh, he does demonstrate, you know, doing this when it flattens and this when it contracts. Of course, you can do it. You can go to in, in the wrist case. The only thing that you don't want to do is this. Doing it with the finger itself. That's completely useless. Some people actually teach that. And I think their students, if they're any you know, good, eventually they figure out that they will never use this motion. But this motion is similar to what happens when you pull the arm back, you know, or wrist back. Also, you could this is will be similar, but it's not this. So Yiguri Menuhin doesn't teach that, and I wouldn't either. But just make sure that, yes, you can just improv do this thing. Go away and back. You see, I'm using the arm forearm right now, not the wrist so much, because with the wrist, is, you can do it here. With the wrist, you can do it in our position. But I don't know. I mean, the fourth finger, my in my case, my fourth finger goes that way to the violin and not as nicely aligned as my this three is just how it's placed in the joint by mother nature. So I will never be able to do it on my fourth finger. Forget it. No matter how much I train, it just won't happen because it's not a natural uh, in biology. Okay. So next question was, my students do perfect vibrato in third position, but when we move to second and first, they completely forget the movement. What we can, we they have to start learning back again in first position. It happens a lot. So when, uh, well, that's doesn't happen, hopefully, a lot. First of all, spending more time in the upper positions is better. I always give a, an a etude or something in the fifth position than in the fourth, sometimes in the fifth and sixth, just sitting there, um, then going to the fourth, then to the third, and then second and first, I would first place my hand around their wrists so that they will be able to do this and then they will make a connection. So that would be my... <clears throat> my suggestion okay um and the last question from here i need to ask before i go to my chat and i will go to my chat um which stage of learning a piece should one stop using the metronome or reduce the amount of time of practicing with a metronome uh so this uh, person has usually a student practice the metronome for both orchestra excerpts and solo pieces so that the students know how to count um, and to be able to follow the accompanists. Well, I think the accompanists actually should follow the students, but okay. 
However, sometimes I feel like practicing with the metronome hold them back from being musical and being free playing a rubato later on. So <clears throat> that is very valid. I mean, if you only have this problem uh, later on, uh, then yes, I, first of all, okay, let's take it back. I would not start with practicing with metronome. I mean, one thing, I, I'm not sure exactly what my, um, the, the, the question when it says, uh, it says to help them count. Maybe it's a metronome that has the voice, like one, two, three, four, and counts, maybe. So in that case, it probably is helpful to do it like once, twice, and then, of course, they should be playing without any metronome. It's just with you learning notes, and that way they learn how to count. The best thing I always suggest to do is take a piece of music, start with a Clapping is okay, but best of conducting. So the little person, whoever, however little they are, they should learn how to conduct. One, two, one, two, not like conductors, but just for that purpose. One, two, one, two, three, four, or one, two, three, one, two, three. Must to do, must do it, okay? And then with that, you pay, play your piece of music and you talk the notes or you sing them, la, 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 or solfege, they do solfege or whatever way they want to sing them. But they sing and they do it with the conducting. And that way they will know the rhythm and then which beat they're playing with. Okay? So I would not use the metronome for that. Metronome is needed to even things out, to even things out. And if things are completely not there, it means that their inner metronome is not working which is actually, yeah, we have to develop this. It's a special thing that we all develop. Um, <clears throat> so I recommend to use different uh, things in the metronome, different ways of using metronome, actually. Yes, as first, when you get to it, you play with a metronome, like, you know, given, what, five bars. I wouldn't play the whole piece with a metronome that's completely counterproductive. So you play a short portion with a metronome, the one that you need to even out, or you, the one you want to check whether you're keeping, you know, how, you know how the music should sound. Okay, fine. Five, five measures, six measures, fine. So then you need to turn this off, the metronome, and play as, as best as you can without it, and hopefully record yourself. And then the result, uh, may be amazing because with metronome it's just perfectly fine. And then up without metronome, it's like, oh my God, I'm all over the place. Okay, why does it happen? First of all, even a little person should understand uh, why it happens is because the part of our thinking, a uh, part of our brain actually, sorry, part of our brain that uh, is responsible for playing with metronome is completely different from the part of the brain that is responsible for playing without metronome. It's just different. It's not the same part of the braille. So you can train with metronome all you want. And unless you then memorize everything completely physically, which I don't recommend, you know, completely automated, automated, automated playing, you know, then yes, and you probably turn it off and you're just playing like body memory, body memory completely. But that's not a good way to learn. So you want to use metronome intelligently, right? So you want to switch between the, when you follow it, when it, it's beating and when it's not beating. There are wonderful apps now, metronome apps that exist where you can set the delay, I believe it's called, um, or uh, random silencing, I, say, I think it's called. So you play, they decide to do that little lever, you slide the lever to like 30%. And it will be giving you one, two, three, four, four, and, and continue in, in that rhythm, you know, in which you are in your tempo. And it will be, metronome will be coming, going, going there. But you will be uh, actually given the silence in which you have to exercise this other part of the brain. And then you go back to the, with the metronome and see if, it, if you work together with it, that means that you're keeping your inner rhythm. If not, you need to work on your rhythm. The easiest exercise to do is to count on off beats um, and put the metronome and play on off beats rather than on the beats. Then put the metronome on every other beat. Very useful. That you can do it on simple metronomes. Then, then you can put the metronome on another third beat and then fourth beat. And that's without that sliding action. You know, that's very useful, I think. So yeah, so playing with metronome is an interesting thing. And many people suffer because they don't know how to use it properly. So I think it was a very good question. Thank you for that question. All right, let's go to now question from the chat. Um, 
how can one fix a, a question from Gonzalo? How can one fix a shaky or bouncing bow as a beginner? Okay, so unfortunately, I would not give you one answer how one can fix because there are several ways why it should can be bad. The usual for the beginner, okay, it will be hard for me to imagine that I'm a beginner right now, but okay, so the usual thing for the beginner is either to press too much and then you get that sound um, and that probably it won't shake. But if you don't, um, I'm not saying that not go press now, no, but it's about the tilt of the bow. So if I change the bow very abruptly and uh, in the middle here, it tends to bounce. So if that is the question, uh, shaky or bouncing bow, I guess probably that is the question. It's you have to watch your tilt, you have to move uh, the bow from the playing flat hair to a little bit of the tilt. You see this, it is here. This is full hair, this is not. And so, and watch how <clears throat> abruptly your changes are. So it's abrupt changes that uh, usually cause it. Um, Okay, somebody could not do this time because it's too late already. That's not a question. Um, what is the best bow hold is the next question. What's the best bow hold? I think the most ergonomic bow hold by now is uh, something between the Franco-Belgian and Galamian, what is known in the country of United States is known as Galamian which is based on the Franco-Belgian. So Franco-Belgian is what pretty much what Russia uses uh, in Russia. Uh, and that is when you look at the fingers, they look like this. So if I'm at the frog, my wrist will be somewhat elevated. Um, but, you know, I, I described this bow hold intensely and in, intensively uh, in the, the beginning of the bowing video. So if you go to the playlist, uh, bow hand beginners, uh, it will be there. Uh, so that is pretty much the across the world right now. It's the bow hold that is being used the most. And if you look at people like uh, Ishak Perlman or Augustin Hadelich or Julia Fisher or Janine Janssen, uh, I, yeah, or uh, basically anybody who is a wonderful player, they pretty much all of them will be playing with that bow hold. Um, the old Russian is the, this one, you know, which you can see on uh, old old uh, recordings of Yasha Heifetz and Misha Elman, and 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 only the person now who uses it as, as a great violinist is Leonidas Kavakos. That is, I don't know how to teach it. So few people play with this now, except for Leonidas Kavakos. Um, most people do the uh, Franco-Belgian. Okay, um, hello, next question from Christina. How without shoulder rest change of under position? We probably mean to slide down, down the violin. Is that what the question is? So if that is, please uh, clarify, like down the position here, or what do you mean by under position? Okay, if you clarify it to me, I will come back to this question and return it. Hello, my good question asker, SS, I remember from last year, last stream. Is the system that provides a great uh, degree of continuity that produced so many great musicians from Moscow Conservatory that made musicians strive compared to the hopeless situation in the US? Um, yeah, well, first of all, I don't think the situation in U.S. is hopeless. No, I don't think it's hopeless at all. As a matter of fact, there are so many Russians now. There are not only Russians, but the Bulgarians and Moldavians and uh, or Moldovians, maybe should should say Belarusians or Belarusians. You know, in current correct pronunciation. Uh, I mean, there are so many people from the east, eastern, eastern European countries, uh, Germany both Germanies who are fantastic players and who are teaching in the United States. So there are very many good teachers, actually. Uh, but the system, yeah, well, you know, like every system has its pros and cons, right? So the pros, or pro, the, the pros, I mean, I guess for 
the Soviet, like the Soviet Russian system of education was that everywhere in the Soviet Union, pretty much the same things were done in terms of uh, how methodology, methodology was pretty much the same. And it was very, very similar to what later Galamian took to the West. Uh, he, uh, Ivan, uh, Ivan Galamian or Ivan Galamian, um, he took it from his first teacher there, Konstantin uh, Mostras. And Konstantin Mostras taught in Moscow Conservatory was ex exceptionally influential uh, pedagogue, along with many others, of course, and, but he was like technically, really technically oriented. So he um, was teaching, you know, the proper bowhand and everybody in the in Soviet Union, then later with the methodology will be written out, was written out. And so, and most good teachers studied in Moscow or St. Petersburg, which was, then was Leningrad. Anyway, so everybody was kind of a, in the same um, stream, so to speak. And therefore, yes, people were playing, the technique was very uniform. So here in this, I mean, we had lots of music schools, like really music schools were very low uh, pay. So many people could afford uh, to get their children to music schools. Here we can't do it because we just have, but you know what? We have lots of other pluses. So hope the situation, I don't think, um, I don't think it's hopeless. There are lots of really good players. They're just, in general, if you compare the numbers to how many people have orchestras in their, just public high schools. I mean, that was non-existent in Soviet Russia. Absolutely. Public high schools were, I mean, they probably only had one choir lesson for the whole week, one hour. That's it. No, no more music, no bands, no orchestras. So you can't really compare. It's very different. But yes, the system um, was such that people will enroll in those music schools and then they go from first to seventh grade and there, and then they will go to the next school, which is another four years. And then they go to conservatory or they will go to a special music school, which is all the learning years in one place. You know, so yes, it was of course uh, helping pr production. It was free also education was, that education was free, it used to be, it's not anymore. Okay, next, um, Maestro, what do you think about the length of the bow and its proportional relation of the length of the violinist's arm? It is something to consider. Yes, it is. Uh, as if you're talking about small people, smaller people, uh, like children, uh, yes, uh, they should have smaller bows, of course. Now, our bows are pretty much the same in length. You can find a little bit shorter bows, but not really. So if the arm is too short, which is a lot of people have it, uh, one thing you could do is to uh, not, hold, not hold the bow here, you know, in between the actual frog and uh, the thumb grip but actually put it on the thumb grip and hold it somewhere there in the middle or even closer here. Get the thumb grip longer. You could do it longer than mine and hold it somewhere here. So that way you're not dealing with the uh, with this part as much. And also you just don't go to the tip. I mean, but pretty much it will be the same usage of the bow. Um, when learning the left hand as a beginner, how do I know when it's a good time to move on from pizzicato to bowing? Oh, yeah, when you, well, I would say, I'd say if you're exceptionally gifted or one is exceptionally gifted for teachers with their students, probably, you know, two weeks, three weeks, four weeks would be all, um, about the regular time of person playing pizzicato between two weeks and four weeks. But for some people, maybe they're so exceptionally or, or uh, coordinated that they could do only maybe 10 days on pizzicato and then start implementing slowly, slowly. But meanwhile, of course, they also do right hand, right? It's not just the pizzicato here. It's pizzicato and separately the right hand. So then you connect the, I call them kingdoms, you know, kingdom of the left, kingdom of the right. And then you connect them, start connecting them. So... Do you have do I have any suggestions? Next question of Andreas. Do you have any suggestions for working on hand coordination? Any pieces or edges that could help me? Uh, coordination is trained on any piece. There are no specific pieces as far as I know that will be for coordination. Uh, it depends on which level coordination is. You know, there the basic level of coordination, for instance, is to change the bow and and with the exactly with the finger falling at first now this can happen 
some kind of unclarity un un like this. You know, so this is no piece at all. It's just a single note, right? Uh, it could be string crossings in string crossings. The same prob problem in string crossings in, in words could be, of course. So it's really coordinating a very small, minute moment um, with, between the left hand and bow hand. You know, the bow hand has to catch the left hand. The bow hand has to go with the finger. For most people, that works better than the other one, thinking the other way. This is about thinking. A lot of our playing, coordination, of course, just, just to make sure that we all are on the same page. Coordination is completely in the brain. Coordination is not your playing. It's a brain sending correct messages at incorrect time. Okay, so when you're coordinating, you have to see that you're not getting tense because if you're getting tense, then you will learn finally, you know, that you will sound good, but you will learn it with tension. And that's like, God forbid, don't want to do it. So I would not say that this is pieces. You have to identify the problem exactly. Which coordination? Is it this or some other more intricate bowing? Um, and then you do go for this. And I would fix every coordination using simple exercises, simple exercises, scales, on scales, um, but not on pieces necessarily. Etudes, the same thing. You, you, you take your problem and then you, you can see it in some easy areas. Start from easy and then go to uh, higher up. But that's really about it. It's not about the material that you're playing. Okay, next question. Is it wrong for the tip of the fingernail to touch the fingerboard, and especially the higher it goes, especially in thirds, depending on how each is shaped? It's not desirable because it would be audible. The, the fingernails, they do sound like zzz sometimes, you know. Um, ideally speaking, we... Okay, so here's the hand, and that's where the fingernails are ending, right? So I don't have much of a natural pad. Uh, and what you see, which looks like a pad, actually kind of created it artificially at some point. Um, so, but yeah, if you have absolutely no pad, like I used to have no pad whatsoever. Let me see if I still have it more on this hand. You know, so I, I, I started cutting them short, my nails short and short and short. And so basically they receded, they do recede. Um, so yeah, it's not, it's not recommended. So in thirds and uh, in here, if, if you, you may be playing that high, for instance, um, well, I suppose my first could be touching, but my nail actually will be on the fingerboard then and not on the string. Yeah. the nail will be touching there. Why? For me, because I have exceptionally long first finger, like index so long. I wish it was shorter, it was shorter, but it's long. So yes, yeah, sometimes it could, but if you can avoid it, it's better to play with a bit flatter, flatter hand rather than this one. I hope that answers your question. Um, hello, a question from Sonata. Um, a rather demand from my students to rem so they always asks rather demands and from from her students to remove their wristwatch during practice. But I always see you teaching with your wristwatch on. Okay, confusing. Absolutely. I have my wristwatch on because I will watch this for just in case uh, if uh, any messages, I'm missing any messages, okay? This is an Apple Watch, and that's why I'm having it on. I never have it when I practice. And um, when you, if you watch my videos, you do not see me there in the watch. So... Uh, no, people should not have watches in lessons or on stage. I mean, they can have them in lessons. I mean, really. So what about the watch? Where, we, we, where should we not have the watch? When or where? On stage. On stage, it's unprofessional to have a watch on the right hand, on the left hand, sorry, on the left hand. Why? Because it will be uh, distracting. It will be just distracting. Something is hanging on your left wrist. Now, I saw people in orchestras, in professional orchestras, if they have long... Uh, long sleeves and they will have you usually watch will be on the, on the right hand um you know so 
for whatever reason, they need to have it fine. If it doesn't bother me visually, there's no wrong with it. Now, on the left hand, I would never have a watch when I practice. Why? Because again, it might feel like a constraint here and I don't like it. Right now, it's a different story. So it's not practicing for me. It's just this stream sessions. Okay, I hope that answers the question. Let me see a little bit back. Um, what's the highest thirds on the second and first string? Where, where should we stop on each key? It's only in this to three octaves for thirds and six. Um, yes, the space gets closer. Yes, I mean, in fact, you know, in the in the Russian system, like the Russian system, in my home school, in my schooling, okay, look, put it this way, we never did any thirds more than regularly. Unless you're playing Paganini concerto, you know, with uh, or or just higher grade, we didn't do more than two octave, uh, two octaves in uh, double stops, because of course the double stops in G major, like the thirds, for instance, right in G major, it will not go further than that. That's pretty much where the two octaves with a couple notes will end, like here, you know. So it's not too high. But then you will be playing other scales. You'll be playing D scale, and your two octaves are going to be really high. And that's all you need to know about the upper positions. But you really want to play the G uh, major scale in three octaves, you know, with the double stops in three octaves. Okay, sure, you could. You, it's, not, it's not going to do any harm. But you don't need to do really more than two octaves or two and a half octaves in double stops. Next question, Augusto. Uh, any advice to prevent the right hand from tightening or shaking, especially during performances? It is fine when practicing, but loses finer control on stage. Okay, that's a very good question. It's not so much um, to prevent right hand from tightening and shaking, it's prevent the whole body from tightening and shaking. Because when we go on stage, we're with adrenaline. You know, it's adrenaline that makes it happen. So when you are, we are, you know, really, um, up uh, and let's put it this way. We're frightened to go on stage, maybe not consciously. Consciously we're prepared. We know it's like good to have a little bit up. Yeah, it's good, but you never know when that, you know, adrenaline goes overboard a bit and it goes overboard a lot of times. So if you notice that two things, you, well, several things that you want to first check. One, does it ever happen when you're not on stage? In other words, does it ever happen, not on violin, just in general, do you ever have any shakiness like someday, you know, suddenly you have a, a little bit of shakiness when you're like at half, half tension, I call it, not like really tense and not really totally relaxed, but it's half tension, you know, like holding the thumb like this. Does it ever, instead of this, right, relax this way and this way. If it wants to do something like that on its own sometimes, it might be a different situation. It might be a little bit medical situation can be helped uh, with some medications. Uh, if it is completely and only on stage, it means that yes, you're frightened, your system is frightened and it uh, the, your pulse pulses up and um, yeah, and everything wants to shake. Now where it's noticeable here in the left hand, if it's tiny bit, it's not going to be noticeable, but here it will be noticeable. So what you can do, you actually have to deal with your nervous system and not so much with the um, with the bow itself or right hand itself because it's not right hand problem, unless of course you have also some technical impediment that can amplify it. But the first thing is adrenaline. It's adrenaline that you want to deal with. Okay, let's go to next question. Okay, while I'm looking. So Gonzalo is asking, could I tell a little bit about my own violin? Um, yeah, my violin is made by Carl Becker. This one is made by Carl Becker. Yeah, it's a very nice Carl Becker, made in 1928. Uh, so it's, um, we call it modern uh, American violin. It's rather simple looking. I mean, it has very nice back, one piece back. But in terms of color, it's like this kind of salmon reddish color that Carl Becker used to like. Um, it's very healthy. It has very good projection. So but other than that, I don't know what to tell you. What else to tell you? It's a kind of bigger instrument in terms of the body. It's bigger. So 
my previous violin was um, was uh, much more uh, diminutive in the body. I mean, like in the shoulders here, you know, in here. So, and also uh, here I had a little bit more room. So anyway, it's just very different. And that was that was an old old uh, northern Italian violin without the name. So, okay, Elizabeth is asking, what exercises would you recommend if you find yourself putting a lock grip of your thumb when playing? Uh, lock grip of your thumb when playing. You mean the thumb gets really locked, like in some kind of a disposition? I, I, I would imagine maybe that is what it means. So, um, exercises, first of all, okay, so here on the G string, you will be to see where my thumb is, what my thumb is doing. I would make sure that I don't do this. I will just let it go. In terms of exercise, again, as I said, I do everything like on simple one note or first one note, two notes. Here, for instance, in order not to hold violin too much, because by the way, that's a good idea. No, don't hold that way much, right? So yeah, I can go to third position and just do it. And I'm not supporting the weight of one of the bows, so you hear it, da, da, da. but you know, I make sure that my thumb is, yeah, it's bending more because it's touching the wood here, right? So it's bending more, bending less, bending more, bending less, but only I will never get to that much up with the wrist when I have the bow in my hand. So it will be between this and that. Okay, this is down, this is up, but not too much up because that's not comfortable to hold. So, but exercises, so I would do that. I mean, I, I use the Shevchik Opus 840 variation, I think it's Opus 8, or Opus 3, 40 variations, Shevchik 40 variations. I use them a lot on, and just, and I kind of redo a little bit um, exercises there. Um, you know, something like that there, or you can, I can transport here. But again, it's basically, I am just enjoying my relaxed thumb. Um, not necessarily that, and, and there are some more of exercises there in the same book when you have to lift the bow and hold it in the air. Um, okay, maybe I should show that like this. And so when you do this, make sure that you go to that position and don't go to this position. That's pretty much what I would recommend and then implement it into the text that you're playing, the other text, the musical musical text. Uh, I'm doing fine today, Ricardo. Okay. Um, and question about the bow. Yes, uh, small adults also. I think I answered this already previously. Um, how do I teach tenths? Tense. Tense are a good question. So, like every every uh, extension, you always teach extension by reaching down. Um, so I will go to a higher position and maybe not even third, maybe higher than that. So let's say uh, for the tenth, I probably will start. Let me go to the F sharp here. So I would be like in fifth position, right? So. So then we have an octave, and then I will start sliding the first finger back, just like that. So from here, it will look like this. And that's the tenth. Okay, so let me tuck my fingers underneath so you can see it one more time. You don't do that, okay? Nobody should do this. This is just, you can see it on the camera. Incremental sliding, doesn't matter how in tune it is. So now we reach the F, uh, the D here. And you see my finger right now is relatively close to how it normally is, but it's not the same already, like it's not like this. It's not going to be like that in a sense. If you don't have a huge hand, if you have a very wide hand, you will have more of normal placement of the finger close to this. But if you have a, a more narrow hand, like my, my not very long fingers, but narrow hand itself, then of course it will be already in this shape when you go to the tent, you see? 
So then you can even continue. I usually continue. I tell, okay, great. So you leave. See, it's just a finger moving back, just a finger extending back. It has to be free here. So. So that is B and F sharp. And of course, here I barely touch on the side or in and up and you know you can you can stretch pretty well actually that way uh and then after that tenth is pretty nice it's easy uh so then you slide back then you go to next note maybe um you know one, one higher and again you slide you can start from the g go to e and then you know do this And again, just train your first finger to go back. That's how we start tense. Um, Leah, hello. Would you have advice for students who have trouble holding their violin high enough? And what is your advice to the right height positioning of the instrument? Thank you. I would say, you know, that the height of the violin, I used to think because I was told that way that height violin is really important that violin, I was taught <clears throat> back in my day that the violin has to, the scroll has to be up, you know, because we were looking at hyphens, you know, and people of that uh, of that generation, most of whom played without shoulder wrists. Uh, and so it was always, oh, they supported it with their hands. So they could bring it up as high as necessary, just with a hand only, but not, not with a shoulder, correct? So, uh, is this would be normal playing? No, that would not be normal for anybody. But if you go up, you know, like this, yeah, that's pretty good. Uh, Menuhin taught this way, you know, he was playing, of course, without any support. So, um, but that's it's, it's held up on the hand. Most people now, especially younger students, they do play with shoulder supports, maybe rests or maybe uh, some pads or whatever. And so, uh, in this case, what, however, it will be. Uh, figured, configured for this person, um, that's how violin will sit. Right? Mine sits this way if I don't raise my shoulder. And I'm lucky because I found that way to for, for it to be. So my uh, the chin rest and shoulder rest combination and how it's adjusted to me is good. So I am able to have in this position. For some people, when they're peacefully resting, uh, shoulder rest or shoulder pad, their violin would look like this. Nothing is wrong with that whatsoever. I mean, to me, in this case, it's just not comfortable. So me, I'm, and I'm here. But um, if it's like this, it's perfectly fine as long as they're comfortable and they're not doing any adjusting motions with their um, the, the back of, of um, with the back muscles. Okay, so. I certainly would not go too very high. If it's very low like that, then of course, no, that will be unproductive. So we'll need to think something with how maybe to put it more on the shoulder, uh, maybe different chin rests. Very oftentimes it's different chin rests. So, but high enough, you're asking about high enough. So probably, I mean, of course, if I played like this, if I were to take it like this and try to hold it, yeah, that will, uh, will look like this. It will, uh -huh, and that would be way too low. It will be closer to the Baroque style when we play it still without moving much. So either you're supporting with a hand, you know, and moving around, supporting with a hand, or, um, or you find the combination of shoulder rest and um, chin rest to allow the violin to hang there in a relatively not too low position. Okay, next question is, let me see, I moved too much. Ha, okay, from Doug, ha, can you tell us a little about Eric and Elma Dofle in their method books? You know, I um, wouldn't tell you too much. Um, I find pretty, I mean, I know their books. Um, I think they're, every method that I have so far encountered has some inconsistencies. I mean, any one of them. The only method that actually was 
pretty much very consistent was that method methodology i should say it wasn't method by a name but it was the combined methodology that was used in former soviet union in russia so that was yeah because they took different parts of different methods and they put them in like um anthologies very nicely organized anthologists uh, anthologies um, of etudes or exercises or you know specifically dexterity etudes specifically shifting specifically whatever so there it existed here Doflane is okay um, as as well as Maya Bang as well as um, I mean there, there there are a few methods that are okay but there will be inconsistencies for instance uh, I, I don't re right now remember offhand because it's method for beginners and I don't teach beginners, but I did go through it. Of course, I like researched and did some uh, looking into all of them at some point. So I remember that I could not find one with which I was 100% agreeing in terms of what follows what. Or for instance, it's all correct, but you know the second finger is given uh, too soon, too low, instead of being in, in this pattern, you know. Uh, working pattern, you know, with, with C sharp, D sharp, and E and A major on A string, right? They, it's given uh, into the C natural because lots of methods, and I don't know why. I mean, I really don't understand why. I think maybe it was easier to write them down that way, but they were all in C major. If you look at that, I mean, there are uh, lots of them are in C major, and I don't remember about the flame. Maybe I'm wrong here. Maybe it's actually in, in D major and in A major. How it should be? Should be by string at first. Uh, in, in major keys, not in minor keys. And so it should be enough. So I, yeah, that's what I want to say. If if the C natural is coming there too soon, then something else needs to be invented. I'm working right now actually on inventing something or using different, different methods to compile them and do something comparable, a little bit at least comparable to our Soviet system so that it exists in this country. Yeah, so I don't know if I will call it my method, but we'll see. It's it's in the works right now. Lemong, uh, how to address a student intermediate level with a really tight hold of the left hand? His thumb position is high and really squeezed, but his violin position is good. Okay, so I would imagine that that means that this, like this, is that the thumb is high there, so violin is kind of low. Is that what it is, Lemong? I hope that's what it is. And he can hold violin steady. He can hold the violin steady. So, do you have any problem? Exercise to fix this problem. So, if he is just really squeezing, so first of all, since I don't quite know where the thumb is, so if the thumb is here and it's high in squeezing, if it's in this area, then this squeezing will be worse and this is really not good at all. So, the thumb has to be in a natural position where it grows, as I call it, you know. So, it's for different persons, different people, different ways. So for me, it's here when I play, right? So when I'm playing, I'm looking for this space not to get tight. And how to get, oh, yeah, he has to come down probably if he's high up here. Um, but and actually, if he's high up here, I'm not sure. He must have been going back then and squeezing there. Um, a thumb position is high and really squeezed. Well, first you need to unsqueeze that thumb. That's the main thing. And what I I don't quite understand the exact mechanics by what is high, high this way, but then if you squeeze that way, you can't really squeeze too much. I mean, you can squeeze a lot, <laughs> but it's not as horrible as when it's back there and squeeze. That is really bad. This is terrible. That cannot, cannot be. But uh, main thing about the thumb, doing exercises like this, um, and it's intermediate level. So he has to go down a notch with exercises, unfortunately. And some people, some boys don't want to do it at all because it's boring. But, you know, like playing playing that shreddic number one type of thing, but slowly and doing things like this. You can do several counts. And so forth. Then another one. Okay, so it's moving the thumb around and that nothing is really changes here. 
So he, yeah, you do need to unsqueeze that thumb. So make it, uh, so he knows that it's not necessary to play uh, with the thumb squeezing so much. Also, my, you might want to go to that Milstein video that I have, even though he might not need it for his fourth finger or whatever, but at least the thumb will be out of the question there and it's like you can play. And let him um, feel it. No, he cannot because thumb is absolutely not involved in here because rather than the support between one and two. And so, you know, to be able to play it and see your thumb just hanging there, he probably will have all kinds of, you know, that. And so then you can observe it in lessons and just literally take that thumb and make it shake it a little bit and see that it stays there loose, relaxed. Again, it's a coordination issue, most likely. So you need to address that issue away. Even it's not about exercises as much as you make. He needs to feel it, the, how it is. But these little things that I just showed, they will help. Um, check your wrist tension in vibrato, as you have advised, Peter says. Check your wrist tension in vibrato. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, it needs should not be tense. Um, <laughs> somebody says your violin playing is so lovely. I just don't agree with your technique. Uh, okay, let me see what technique you do. Oops, wait a second. What just happened? Nothing. I'm pressing on something here. Okay. Ricardo, I tried it and my had my hand cramping really bad. Okay, Ricardo, what did you try? I guess I need to look up again and see what it is that you're asking me before. You don't. You just ask me how I was doing. Okay. Uh, you need to be more clear, clear about what's cramping, where cramping. Is it the hand cramping when you're trying the uh, wrist vibrato? I don't know. I tried it. My technique, whatever I have, that's a lot. Technique is a very broad field. So Ricardo, if you have something specific, please ask it. Uh, Daniel, um, going down, Daniel Rodriguez, wait a second. Uh, no. Uh, <laughs> sorry, it's just, some people just thank me and I, I'm reading them. It's beneficial to learn piano a bit. Is it beneficial? Okay, question, good question from Pat. Uh, is it beneficial to learn the piano a bit first before you learn the violin? I would much advise it to anybody to first learn piano. I would. I first learned the violin and then I had to learn piano and it was an uphill struggle for a while and it's just piano is so it's all offers so much more in terms of knowledge of uh, theory will all come from your knowing of the piano and how seeing because you can see keys you can see the notes you know pitches on the piano and plus piano is an instrument of course is so much versatile than violin is like there is no comparison so yes i'm all for starting from the piano and doing violin a bit later, meaning like, you know, if it's professional start, you know, you start, you can start piano at two. I mean, okay, no, uh, at four or five, and then add violin half a year later, even it's already good, or maybe a year later, um, in my opinion, or start them both together, but they have to be really close by. Um, okay, Elizabeth, okay. Thank you, thank you, thank you. That's for compliments. Um, do you teach violin in university? If so, the university has a master's degree for violinist. Yes, Noah, that's in my videos. It's like every video of mine says that I'm professor of violin at University of North Texas. That's where I am. And yes, we do have master degrees and doctorate degrees and everything in between. Um, thank you, Emiko. Emiko, hello. Uh, Gabriel, um, Gabriel is asking, how do you approach the different nation systems when teaching beginners? Beginners, um, I will never, ever, ever teach any systems to beginners. Beginners have to know just one type of good intonation, and it will be Pythagorean intonation. That's it. Like there, nothing about the keys and nothing about playing in a quartet because they're beginners that don't do that, they shouldn't do it. Um, so 
uh, F sharp, uh, first finger of F sharp and twinkle twinkle. You, okay, so in in our ways of now we have uh, we have uh, calibrated um, tuners, so you can just put a tuner. I use personally, well, for my students, I much recommend. It. Actually, made a video for my students only, though it was private video. Um, I use it using the tuner that they use. Um, I, th I think it's wonderful. Let me look for it here. It's called Total, Total Energy Tuner. That's what I use on the phone. But without the phone, I just have a tuner tuner. So it, it also is pretty fine. Um, but for beginners, I don't know if they like machines, little programs, whatever, uh, that's, that might be helpful. Or we were all taught somehow without them, right? In my time, no tuners at all. So it was like this. You place the first finger on every string at the same exactly place. So, and you check the first ones. You can start from this one. And you place your B in the B, okay? And then you check it with E open. And you see that you have a perfect fourth. That is kind of what I call gels. Then you memorize that sound. Uh, with a beginner, you can play it, and then they have to repeat the tone on their violin. Of course, your A's have to be synchronized as well. So, and then you you memorize the how it sounds. It's an intervallic difference between the two pitches. That's what's very important. That's how we train our ear. Okay. So, but this one, luckily, you can actually tune with E open, and it will be showing you or you can tune it to the Pythagorean um, style in the tuner and it will show you exactly the same, it will be very clean. So then you do the same thing here. Also in these notes, of course, A, E and uh, A and E will ring. They will ring with open string. B doesn't ring because we don't have a B string. B string would have been next string if we had it up, but we don't. Okay, fine. So then you can check it with E. And then you memorize how that interval is. And then you go to E string and you do exactly the same thing. You put the finger in the same place. You just adjust your hand for E string and the finger goes in the same place. And I already remember how a full step sounds. That's how you find where the F-sharp is. And that's the only place of F-sharp that they should put it. No others. Please do not confuse them. Violin is hard enough. First, we learn how to play in one system. Until we learn it, we shouldn't go to any other systems. At least, you know, that's how we all learned. Mm -hmm. Like all good players learned like that, like that in our childhoods. Uh, John is asking, could I share a couple of warming up exercises other than scales or at least, or at least a general routine? You know, honestly here, uh, what happened in my time warming up? I never liked scales to warm up, never. I had to play them because it was suggested that's the best way to do it, scales. For me, it was always not very good. Uh, but I did it for years, and then I thought, hmm, I can do something else. So I do all kinds of things to warm up. I don't have a routine of warming up. A routine of warming up for me is to have my hands literally warm, okay? So part of warming up is real, like physiological. If your hands are cold, you need to warm them up. You can stick them under warm water, under hot water, and then they will be warm. And then it's a matter of warming up your brain to play something. And that you can do actually without playing. You can do that when you're warming up your hands underwater, you see? So that's the most effective way to warm up actually, because when we warm up, okay, our hands are cold and we don't have warm water, let's say, right? So what I would do instead of, instead of just running them, and I can show you what I do for running as well. Um, if I cannot do it any other way, um, then I, I will do this kind of routine. I will play um, chromatic scales. So 
I do this like about or and also E string, right? So really fast. And again, if my hands are completely cold, I probably will be just a little bit slower. Like this. But you know, because I do have the dexterity equipment in my hand, I don't need it really slowly. So you do it and then I do it like one time on each string about that many times and then i stop and i put the violin down and i stop and my hand warms up literally warms up if it was cold so that's what i would do if i don't have any other means of warming up my hands so another thing that i am saying in my other video how to warm up i just actually made a video if you didn't see it you should really see it because that's how you really warm up physically you warm up you get your blood going and that's what it is and then you can you should be able to play anything right away you don't need to warm up that if you have to play something else when you're literally warm it means that your brain isn't within your piece or at your piece or at your whatever else you might be playing caprice etude scale whatever your brain is like okay like all right and so your hand starts playing because you motorically remember like <laughs> motorically you remember that but your brain is sort of like okay okay i guess he's playing right now i guess okay should i go and supervise maybe meanwhile you can hear like oh my shift was bad i'm not warmed up no it's your brain is not warmed up <laughs> You're perfectly warm if you're literally warm. You see what I mean? So, uh, but in terms of warming up exercise, so I do this. Uh, there was a time in my life when I was doing vibrato. I would, and vibrato, I honestly, again, uh, yes, I do exercises. Yes, I suggest exercises. And I did do them myself, I promise. But I hate them. I don't like them unless I myself invent them for myself. I don't like to play somebody else's exercises. So for wrist, uh, for, for vibrato, for instance, I would never do a vibrato exercise. I would just play something with vibrato, you know, like. And I'm composing thing right now, and I don't know what it means. But let's say I have a piece, and I have a second movement in the piece, or I'm playing some slow piece, whatever. And I would just play a portion of that piece, the first thing I do, if I'm warm, physically warm. Yeah, so I will play that, and then suddenly everything is very clear in my mind, and my hands have been warm already, so it's good. So that's another thing that I do. Um, Emiko asks, um, do you have any exercises for students to help them get more comfortable using long bows? Um, yes, uh, those will be pretty much, uh, that's what they will be. They will be, I will have them play long bows. Emiko. So what really helps is to get them, I mean, it depends on the level of the student, of course, but if you have, let's say, beginner, for beginners, it will be to play eight counts on each bow, you know, Two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Now, I would be on a string right now, I'm just demonstrating it so you don't hear interference, right? And then eight. So for beginners, for if you have somebody more advanced, you just up up the uh, difficulty of it. And uh, for pre-professionals or professionals, we should be able to have very slow bow, uh, for 60 seconds. So then you switch to seconds, and then they have to be able to do 30 seconds on one bow without stopping. So that bow should not be doing things like that. If it starts stopping, it means it's too slow. They have to be a little bit, uh, a little bit uh, faster, but still can keep that note going. So, you know, intermediate level here. So I would say, I think I counted 12. I mean, in my tempo, it was 12 counts. So 12 is a good thing. It's a piano, pretty much it will be piano. It won't be forte or anything, but yeah, they should have to do like a short one octave scale, at least one way up every day to have uh, the whole bow used in a slow tempo. <clears throat> it's very helpful. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, getting my students used to play with more confidence. Mm, playing through more confidence 
play through pieces when they're ready. Don't play them before they're ready too much. But they should actually play them through even when they're getting ready. But yes, playing um, with more confidence, usually it's playing more pieces. And the teacher sometimes needs to know when to pull back and not to be too critical. So, but again, a lot of people are not very critical at all. So some criticism, of course, is necessary. And the more they can take it, the better they will be playing. But nevertheless, confidence, we encourage and we push them perform, 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 performing in front of people, of course. Absolutely. That's confidence also. Um, Homan N asks, 50-year-old intermediate learner, fifth book of Suzuki is getting difficult, but I'm told to, I have good tonality, probably playing in tune. What do you advise to helping me playing in higher positions, scales, etc.? I would, in upper, higher positions, I first of all, much recommend that you watch, if you haven't, watch my pattern scales video, the pattern scales. And that's the two octave scales in which you run in <clears throat> all kinds of positions. So you start from here. And you go, you know, from first finger, and then you go away. And you go, will go and play in that e, A major or maybe G major. I, I, there, I think I give it through G major. And so forth. And back and forth, you will you'll be in really high position. So do you get used to it uh, without shifts, okay? So next thing I would uh, say, you probably can challenge yourself and go to some higher position etudes. Like they also, they sit in one position only without shifting, just being in the fourth position, being in the fifth position. Sit, S I T T, are great etudes for that. Don't need to do the whole etude if they're too long, just take a couple um, lines, three lines. If you're, you're not a professional, so for professionals, pre professionals, of course, we will do whole etudes. But for non-professionals, you know, one line would be probably useful in fourth position, fifth position, sixth position, seventh position, um, those. And eighth, already, it's already high up. So, um, and after that, you start doing them with shifts. And the shifts are good etudes in um, Kaiser, in Mazas, um, in, I would, I would definitely do Kaiser and Mazas. And Wolford, I'm not sure, yeah, Wolford probably has some beginning shifting. I don't remember only. Wolford usually are first etudes uh, by Wolford. Um, but then we go to Kaiser and uh, my Mazas. You know, those are very useful things. Okay. Um, thank you. Regards from Brazil. Same to you. Uh, what scales book for beginners to intermediate I recommend it? <clears throat> You know, out of Facebook, uh, Facebook <laughs> scale books <laughs> that I know in this country, um, it would be probably Barbara Barber. Yeah, she has a nice compilation. Uh, started one year ago, Oranaro uh, asks, um, are you a beginner? Yes, my teacher was a Soviet formed from Tomsk. Oh, hello, from Tomsk. I moved to another country and had no teacher. I'm worried about my position. How can I check that it's okay? <coughs> How you can check that your position is fine? I have a Zoom lesson with somebody who is who you who you could trust. I have a Zoom lesson with them. Uh, there are lots of I mean, actually there are lots of Russians. Well, I don't know now. I wanted to say that there were some Russians from Moscow Conservatory, but by now I forget it. There's war and no, it's it's not going to work anymore. But there are still people in this country. I'm not sure which country you're in, um, who will be able to check on your position and to find if you want more advice, you can always email me. Eric, uh, how can I work on my memory to learn pieces faster? I struggled to learn long pieces that uh, that's all the repertoire is. Does it get easier? <clears throat> um, yes, of course it gets easier. When the more you train it, the easier it we should get. Um, so we learn by memory in different ways. Um, we can learn from here completely by like by the tune. And we can also learn somewhat 
um, no, from here I'm in the mind, it won't be the two. No, sorry, I didn't mean this. I meant by construction of the piece, okay? And we can learn also by tune, which will be more the ears and and so on. So uh, you're struggling to learn long pieces. So by that, do you can you learn short pieces pretty fast? Like for instance, um, question about Kreutzer number two. It, mo most uh, here in the West, it's Kreutzer number two. For us, in many other countries over there, we work Kreutzer number one, depending on the edition. But that one. So that one that goes like this and can be played with millions of bowings and so on, right? So that one, uh, when I teach people how to learn by memory, I will just go and say, okay, so how many times does the same thing repeat? And you will just, okay, you count it. You don't even play. You just count it. And then you count it in your mind and you play it. Like three times it repeats like this. So that thing repeats three times. So second time, third time, and then on the fourth time it does instead of it goes, so it does a transition, and then the same thing, the same uh, sequence uh, will repeat again three times, and then it will transition again to a one uh, third lower. So that memorization is not by hand and it's not by tune; it's completely structural. So we use it. The, this, I mean, and, and sequences, you know, and there is a sequence, of course, we memorize sequences. Oh, it's a sequence. Okay, here I go. But then in between those things, a lot of times it will be tune. When you just sing it, you sing it and you memorize how it goes. You memorize the intervallically, you know, something that uh, starts. Well, how I would remember that besides that it can be probably just stuck in my memory. That I would remember sixth. Dot, major six dot, oh, yeah, and then I'm going down. Um, or, you know, octave, and then the octaves is filled up, filled out, you know. You know, that will be filling the octave down. You know, that's how I would remember it instead of just memorizing, memorizing, playing many times. So, um, but again, all long pieces, you see, Eric, all long pieces, they're constructed of short, short portions. Then you connect the portions. You start telling yourself, some people it helps to tell a story. You know, not exactly the story from the beginning to the end. It should be the same. No, but you're like, okay, it starts from here. And then I go up in the positions because it's the first time. Second time, it will be repeating down, let's say, in a recapitulation. The same thing will be repeating like, lower octave so in that case i will tell myself okay oh first time it goes higher because it's first time and second time it's more tired i don't know it doesn't go high up it has nothing to do with character though it's just memorization of which octave i am in or key the same thing oh that's an, that, that this is the key that makes me feel higher and this is the key makes me feel more comfortable you know here that's how I would re remember some of the things. I don't know if it helps a lot, uh, but that is a very big topic. Uh, memorization is a big topic. So, um, again, I'd be happy to uh, help you uh, individually if you reach out individually. Uh, Irene Young, uh, Yang, how would you teach the to the pad to press? Oh, the finger pad, I would imagine, right? How you teach the pad to press? You know, to put this on a string without pressure and then press it down. No pressure and then, okay, here we are, here we are, and then press it down. And that's how I would teach the press. Sophia, how do I find new repertoire to practice? How do I find repertoire that uses specific techniques I want to work? Well, um, depends on what technique you want to work then you maybe well i mean i guess you can't really google it i mean i think forums can be a good idea for it honestly specific because your your question is good but it's very general you know so uh how you find a new repertoire to practice uh look at the well, I wouldn't probably recommend going to Suzuki books because they're very specifically Suzuki. But there is a, there are a book of repertoire, graded repertoire. Put it this one, graded repertoire for violin in Google search. 
and I'm sure you will get some things in there. And then um, if you find what you find, uh, you can ask me this question specifically, like what, what maybe in next stream or just write it in a comment or, or use my email that I now provide for this channel. Um, so what, uh, how you find the repertoire, just that, that's pretty much how you would find it. You need to know your level, where you are, and then the pieces that will be in the graded repertoire, it will, it will be given on your kind of grade, on your level. Um, so it will be then easier for you to ori orient yourself. Um, and yeah, and so then knowing what you want to work on specifically, if you already know, then again, you can go through these books of great repertoire and you'll find something. Uh, would you turn the left hand to left? Yuren is asking me. Uh, would you turn the left hand to left first? Or you mean left hand like this and then here? Before you play, you mean? Without violin? No, absolutely not. There is no reason to uh, make that. It's an extreme position that we have to go sometimes. Absolutely not. Don't do this to your to your students or to yourself. Yeah, I actually had somebody recently that uh, was showing me, uh, you know, practicing this. It's terrible, don't do it, don't do it. So at first when people play, if you start with a method that is using all four, like one, two, three, like the usual method, then you will play just with three fingers and leave it alone. Don't worry about this turn at all. That only comes when necessity of the fourth goes on there. That's when we start turning. And there's a whole big can of worms when we start doing it. That's why I now, if I were to teach anybody beginner, if I were, I don't, but if I were, I would go through this method and just teach um, two, three, four this way because then the hand turns naturally and you don't need to torque it so much okay and then go here and fit the first finger and then your hand is already enough but this completely unnecessary it happens later when you start playing hard and harder things and in higher positions on g-string then naturally it will happen there um, you won't be able to reach otherwise but don't do it too early and don't do it on its own please say something about the suzuki method uh shariful islam is asking well, I can say that Suzuki method exists. <laughs> I do not teach Suzuki method. I do understand um, its value as teaching uh, young children to appreciate the, the music, uh, to teach uh, violin by Suzuki method. I only think that very, very good teachers can do it. But uh, by yourself, I wouldn't recommend that because the pieces uh, given there are given not for professional learning. They're given to involve children and, you know, just let them play whatever they play. <coughs> Yuri, thank you very much for your compliment. Uh, hello to you, to Brazil. Uh, how Anthony is asking, how could I pra practice uh, to play with shifting fast and relaxed? Um, shifting fast and relaxed started to, to from playing sh from shifting slow and relaxed and not pressing with fingers when you move. That's the main thing, not pressing with fingers. So I do have a whole, I have two videos right now at the shifting, I think two or maybe already three, I can't remember, but it, there will be in the left hand technique playlist and that will be in the beginning. Um, in, the meaning, in the beginning, you can check the intermediate. Maybe I already made the video on this or maybe not. Um, if not, I will make one. But um, yeah, there I explained. So that is the basis of shifting lightly. So once, it, once you can shift lightly, the speed is no, not a problem because pretty much everybody can just go like this. It's, fast is easy, but usually people press during shift on a basic level. So that basic level has to be untrained and forgotten. And then you can, you play your shifts fast and relaxed. Um, Peter, hello. Can you illustrate the method you employ to achieve a seamless bow change where the no change in pitch is perceptible? 
Um, my method in uh, well, it depends where, first of all. So if it's here, I mean, the some change of a bow change will be perceptible. Uh, very, very infrequently. Uh, if you hold the bow very much, I mean, basically if you're, you just hear it less, but by your ear, you would always hear it anyway. Uh, but the same thing by the tip. I mean, here I do it with the help of, uh, you know, cushioning of the fingers, you know, of being able to hold the uh, weight of the bow like this. Yeah, you know, I mean, sometimes it's almost the whole weight you hold. Now, if the movement is really slow, you cannot do this motion at all. You have to be really still. You can just do this with fingers then, right at that moment when you are changing. Um, but pretty much, yeah, it, it will be noticeable anyway. So what usually happens when it's not noticeable at all, there is a little bit of vibrato going on. It will be the same pitch, but a little bit of vibrato going on. And then... You know, then it's less noticeable. The same thing here, you know. It's like it the vibrato helps to diminish the um, the sound of it. So yes, loose hand. At the tip, definitely. At the tip, it's very easy. Everybody can do it. Uh, here at the frog, some people uh, will use this, but not in very piano and not in very slow tempo. No, it's a mid-tempo to faster tempo. Uh, you can use this very nicely just uh, above the string, meaning not hanging down with the elbow because that makes them more noticeable. The bow changes, I mean. Emiko, you're very welcome. And Noah. Um, SS is asking, everyone's sequence of repertoire is different. Is there an ideal one? Such as Vietnam must be learned before... Something, I guess. S-T-H. Or Tchaikovsky before Paganini. Should we follow this sequence... The sequence of period. Uh, no, I wouldn't follow the sequence of period too much. Although we usually start when we start when we usually start with kind of baroque repertoire um, because lower positions usually like Vivaldi, Concerto, Bach. It would be there. It, it's much more accessible for early uh, and of course early learning. And of course there are some. It's very important, absolutely very very important for anybody who learns violin to play pieces that are written by violinists. Violinists, like Vivaldi was a violinist once for Bach, was not primarily, he knew how to play violin, but he was not primarily a violinist. So Bach is not a good idea to learn on violin too soon. Um, there are wonderful pieces and, and um, pieces and harder pieces and harder pieces by Don Kla. Charles Dancla, D-A-N-C-A-L-A, -A -A, Dancla, French. And basically, you will find a lot of really good uh, pieces by French composers for children, specifically for children, for, for beginners. So Dancla wrote lots of them. There will be school, the Easy School of Melody, I think it's called, and there will be uh, variations. Uh, he's a set of air varié. They're called air varies. So uh, there are six of those and another six. I mean, there are lots of music by Don Claude, which is fantastic. Reading, concerto, uh, wonderful thing, a, a violinist, uh, sights, of course, sights, we have to play that, and so on and so forth and so on and so forth. So um, Vietan should, okay, Vietan, you see, again, there will be some schools that would be going in order how you can already perform it like in front of other people, perform it rather well, you know. So if you do it in this way, then Vietan should, could be, Vietan, to be performed with orchestra, let's say. What you would prefer to perform with orchestra first, a Vietan concerto or a Tchaikovsky concerto? A Tchaikovsky concerto in front of people, if you were to learn it, right? Yes, you will perform it, bef you know, after, before you will go and perform Vietnam, because Vietnam is just so much virtuosic. But what happens with us, with our Russian system, which you might be acquainted with, 
uh, that uh, we were given a lot of very hard concerti to work and play as a study concerti, not as a real thing. We still do it here too. Here, unfortunately, people don't know much about the wonderful study concerti by Berio. There are lots of them. And if anybody plays like Sin de Ballet, they only play here for whatever reason. There's number nine, there's number seven. Uh, there are number of other numbers as well. I mean, I use at least seven and nine at least. Um, Kreutzer concerti, uh, there is the Viotti concerti, um, Rod, uh, Rod, Rod, or Rod, uh, in Russian it was called Rode, but it's actually Rod. So, uh, who wrote a lot, you know, very famous caprices, right? But there are lots of concerti that he wrote, lots of concerti, they're good ones. Spore, oh my goodness, Spore concerti. So, we, we study all of those before we are given any first real concerto like Bruch or, you know, some, something with music, not written by a violinist. Out of written by a violinist, I think probably, well, after Viewities and Berios and some Spores, uh, we we'll go to um, Vinyavsky would be first. Vinyavsky number two, of course. So, and then after that, so you will go kind of up and up and up, but then they will be like, they will give you, um, I, I would give somebody like Vita number five. It won't be for the performance with orchestra, but it will be in the performance in the class or maybe even a recital here at school somewhere. Yeah, but it's not, it's going to be somewhat as a study concerto to some level, although I would really demand so after that hike up, you go down to like Kachaturian or something, you know, like a real big piece, but you already have the chops, so how we call it, right? And then you kind of go kind of slightly lower, but not really, because Tchaikovsky is virtuosically easier than Vitan, just in terms of how many chords there are or whatever, but it's not much easier either, you know, because it's very awkward in places. It's not violinistic. Brahms, Tchaikovsky, um, not very violinistic at all. Um, even though both had help of, uh, from violinists, but still can't compare. So yeah, if you guys should mix and match. Um, Albert, thoughts on how to develop determined amount of left hand finger pressure to use? Well, again, it kind of was maybe with a question before. Imagine that the fingerboard is made out of Play-Doh. You know, Play-Doh that kill children use, right? So it all was, and so and you depress the string to the fingerboard. So that's all you need to do. Now, when for instance, I was, I mean, I actually so when I was young and I was told, and I think I understood it incorrectly, you know, that articulation had to do with the amount of banging, like this. So I can bang my finger into the string, or into the fingerboard rather, really. You know, that sound that you probably hear, right? It's excessive. Nobody needs it. But some te teachers teach it to this day, and that it leads to injuries. So what it needs to be there is to depress it fully. It has to be fully depressed to the fingerboard. And so that's no pressure. That's harmonic on C sharp, on, on the C sharp note. I increase the pressure. I get C sharp, it's a little fuzzy. I don't press yet fully. Now I press fully, but not excessively. So that pretty much gives you the amount of pressure that you should use. So I hope that answers your question. Um, okay. Um, Luis said probably, thank you. I am not fluent in Spanish, not yet. Translation, thank you, RCNT. Very happy to say, <laughs> okay. Thank you very much for translation. Okay, let's see. Next question, Sanjeev. Hi, I recently bought Stradivarius violin copy for 200 US dollars. Are they good for beginners like me? Probably. 
probably. You know, every copy that you get on the market will be either copy, most, most of them will be copy of Stradivarius, most of them. Um, or, or Amati, I know, mean, I think most of them do Stradivari because it's like the, you know, most known name and yeah, universally best violins probably and most expensive. So everybody uh, do this. Hello, people from India. Yes, I know. That's how I also got the time. So people in India could see me. Um, okay. Wait a second. I'm skipping here. Sorry. Sorry, sorry. Okay, so Eric, okay, I guess I did answer the question of practicing, I mean, of, of, of memorization correctly. I mean, as I thought, I guessed correctly. Okay, um, Oswald is asking, hi, what are the best exercises or tips for violinists' left hand to avoid excessive tension? I would say it will be tips not so much exercise, again, any exercise, anything that I say, it should be used on exercises. One thing that I want to make very clear, the uh, music, like exercises is notes written in, on piece of paper, right? Um, or etudes, whatever, it's music written down. These are just, it's a material for you to use a certain pattern of movement or the certain pattern of your thinking, actually. That comes first, and then that translates into your movement. And that's what you use on these notes so that you're not bored, or that you isolate. For instance, if you do exercise just for the second finger, you can just repeat the second finger a lot of times. And it becomes your exercise. And if you don't have maybe the desire to like do what I just did, like which I thought, okay, I want to exercise my second finger. I will just play just that. And I will look at my second finger with the idea that I know what I'm after. Like I'm after how it falls onto the string and how it lifts, like falling exactly in the same place, intonation, and lifting very fast for good articulation. That's my goal, right? And I want to exercise my second finger only. Well, I probably I could do just da, 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 but then I will play off, off open string. So I probably will play with, usually will play with the first finger uh, and second. Da, 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 So here you go. That's how I just created an exercise. Then I can say, well, what if I will play it after third finger? Well, I mean, da, da, that is not going to be audible, right? So yeah, it still will be probably first Two, two and one or two and open. Those are the two possibilities that you have to use your second finger if, if you're working on that. So um, the exercise is not that important. The material, what's important, what is your after? Okay, so your question is to avoid excessive tension. So the tip to avoid tension is, if I could just say it in like one sentence, is play something and then tell yourself, Okay, now I will repeat in much easier way, in a much easier, lighter way. That's it. Just lighter. Or you can say, let go. You don't know what you ask to let go. You just let go. But you do need to get the same notes, the same pitch, so things do not change. Okay? So if I, again, I will just demonstrate something really easy. What I'm playing... And let's say I'm playing this and I, for some reason, I'm banging my fingers into the violin and they, they, and then everything gets like really jammed. So I would say, okay, just now easier. So, but if it's easier, you see the difference. This is tight. This is not tight. My fingers are still in the same place. Here is pressing. Here is not pressing. Okay. So can I play it like that at all? So yes, of course, I will get that kind of sound. It's kind of hard to do because it's right by your ear, it's really unpleasant. Um, so then I will do half pressure of the finger, half pressure, I would imagine. Okay, so this is my first word, half pressure to the string. So I would go for that. My intonation might get worse. If it gets worse, I would probably 
then exercise with that half pressure. So the sound will be kind of fuzzy. But I would make sure that my fingers can function in the way when they don't press, very little pressure. Or so, and, and then gradually go to all the way to the string, but not more, as I said before. So, but what another thing you could do if you're an like, advanced player, you just play some kind of passage and then you just repeat and let it go. Let it go. It really works. It usually works. Um, something gets easier. Usually, if there are shifts, they get lighter. But of course, you need to have the basics of light shifting to be able to do light shifts in on any any shift you can make it lighter so if that happens then that let go works like magic the same thing of fingers if you do this like less pressure exercises a little bit um then you already know that you can play on the surface of the string play on the surface of the string play pro more pressure with the bow less pressure with fingers pretty much but that's actually altogether a truth so in general we play more the faster we go the more we play into the string here the li lighter the left hand has to be so this okay um uh, yuri is about pandemics we as students how can we find motivation to study oh my goodness good point because i mean you pretty much don't perform is that where it is for for performance yeah, because we kind of need, most people, most people, ideally speaking, maybe we should just practice because we love it so much. But absolute majority of people don't like practicing that much. We want to get some result, correct? And so to get the result, you need some goal to go to. Like, in usually for most people, it's a performance of some sort. So I would say with pandemics, organizing even the Zoom performances probably would be a good idea. You know, sometimes people play you know next next to each other but like with the uh, um, earphones and uh, um, synchronizing their playing um, with pianists i mean finding the way to perform and scheduling some performances i think that's what keeps the motivation up um or anaro asks me um oh wait a second i i i I skipped those all. Another question. Are there any special exercises that help to be clear and precise shifting? Yeah, I mean, clear and precise shifting. Again, um, it will be, yes, getting to the position. I always go, my students know, if they have problem with shifting, I would first put them in slow shifts. But I used to do it really slowly for a long time. Uh, but then I realized that, yeah, you can go, you have to go faster at some point. But yes, it all starts with a still slow practice because in slow practice, that's when you find exactly how much, how far you go, exactly where you stop, where you press the finger back. Okay. So I would uh, go with this. I would recommend, at first, I would recommend my shifting videos because I think I'm pretty, you know, detailed in there. Um, and then... And then you play sh shifting exercise, etudes. I mean, exercises, the exercises for shifting are arpeggios and in scales. Yeah, so you will play arpeggio. Oops, ah, my shoulder has left its place. So somebody was asking me, actually, I'm not sure if she wrote anything. I guess maybe not. Just a second, since it's my shoulder rest is off somebody was asking me something about shifting back or whatever but i guess i don't see it okay okay i'll just go for the exercise for shifting yeah so it will be our arpeggios in scales and we do a lot of arpeggios in scales and you can do even more than we usually do so so first shift is this one of course it's through open string right but then you have You know, that we had two shifts on here. If I do A major or from A, rather. And then you go down and there are several fingers to go down. So in this one, I probably will just go through the fourth and all the way back. But um, whichever fingers you prefer, you choose to do, that that's the ones that you train. In G major, it will be then... So 
where the D is open, you would use your D open, but if you play something. minor arpeggio starting from the G open. Okay, so how you train? Well, first you do it slower. You do it slower, but very lightly. The shifts have to be light. And then you train the arrivals that way, and then you speed them up little by little. And then you know where you're going. So it takes a lot of time and good, I mean, concentration, actually. Maybe not that much time, a lot of concentration first. Mark uh, is asking me, I want to ask, is, is the tuner not always correct? Because, for example, when I practice a B natural in third position, tuning with G open string, the tuner shoulder and B natural is a bit flat. Of course, yes, uh, it will exactly show that because you never, ever, ever check um, a single note that you want to be in tune, like B. You want this note alone, correct? You're not looking for a double stop to play like B in G, G open like that's called a double stop if you're I'm playing yeah we'll never put it here it's terribly flat it's terribly flat because I as I said in the beginning of the stream if you haven't watched the beginning of the stream I was answering the question how to find the F sharp so watch that one that's where the B is. So it has to tune exactly with E open because you can only check uh, perfect intervals on the violin if you want to play single notes out of tune. We have several intonations on violin, and I would not recommend people to think by keys. Don't go there, really. Don't go there until much, much, much later, if ever at all. So it's much better to know two types of intonation, one for single stops, for single notes, and the other for double stops. And I did videos on both uh, single notes intonation, how to clean them, and on double stops. So Mac, please go and watch these videos. You, I mean, the video, especially on the single note intonation, it's all there. So of course, your B cannot be done with a metronome, I mean, uh, sorry, tuner. Now, your tuner, I also think, is probably showing you the well-tempered tuning. It's not a good uh, tuning in the tuner. Okay, so if you're using tuner, if you're a beginner using tuner, you need to use the tuner that has Pythagorean um, tuning system. Pythagorean only. No well-tempered and nothing else. And not just. Not just intonation and not uh, well-tempered. Only Pythagorean. Okay, then it will the B will be in the right place. Um, John is asking whether I recommend stretching and show in 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 so if so when before after playing or maybe both any favorites. Yes, I do recommend stretching. I have a video on the corner stretch and I have a whole video on stretching that was just lately out. So yes, I do recommend. You can do most stretching we do afterwards, but if uh, you have, by any chance, a person has any kind of injury specific, uh, well, not specific to violin, but injuries that affect violin playing, let's put it this way, uh, then some of these stretches need to be done before playing and after playing. But again, I have two videos out, one earlier about the posture and corner stretch, and the other one uh, was lately about uh, warm-up techniques, and there will be stretching there, warm-ups. Um, John also thought a Suzuki method. Okay, uh, Homan is asking, Suzuki method, what other method do you commit to adult learners? I'm self-training and take classes. I would like you to find a good patient teacher. I think she'd be open to teach other methods. I see, so the teacher there, the teacher uses Suzuki books, correct? Uh, then, uh, yeah, okay. Um, I <clears throat> I think, again, you know, the sequence of pieces, this is what pretty much the methods are. And Suzuki method, as I said, a Suzuki method, in my opinion, is not, it wasn't conceived, it became now, it's being used to train like violinists, violinists, just because for some reason it became... Um, 
oh, what would be the word? Um, it became popular, popular, popularized because it's a very good marketing scheme as well. You know, like anything becomes super popular. Just look for marketing. Look for something, <laughs> something beyond the just what you get. Okay. Um, so I am very, I was very, very surprised when I first saw Suzuki growing that far, that fast. I was just very surprised. But I guess it did so in this country because there was really just lack of graded repertoire books. And so Suzuki became that graded repertoire book. And later on, it just caught on its own because there were institu Suzuki institutes and people really started you know, using it. But again, if it's a very good teacher using Suzuki method, a very good teacher would add other pieces to the pieces that are in Suzuki. Um, a very good teacher would absolutely use scales and arpeggios and etudes in addition to what uh, students do in Suzuki. Absolutely, they will. So if, if the teacher doesn't use it, it means, well, maybe you should go look for another teacher if you're very serious. Um, if you have a very good teacher, in, inquisitive and patient and open-minded, and you ask her or him a question like, okay, uh, could you look in some other methods? Uh, so not methods. It, it, I wouldn't look at methods. Like, you know, that's what I wouldn't recommend, especially if you're in book, what book you are. Yeah, I think, did you say the book five already? So it's already not a method. You don't need any method. You just need pieces that suit your level. Okay. So... Um, I would, again, Barbara Barber has a wonderful several books. Um, one I mentioned was on scales. It's very, pretty, very good. Uh, and also on pieces. There are good pieces out there in her books. And again, go and look up, uh, as I suggested to somebody already, uh, to graded, graded repertoire books and see what else is there. And there will be some good choices in there. Uh, and then John says, Letourneau wrote a nice student repertoire for young learners. I don't know Letourneau, so I'll look it up. Um, Oranara, what do you think about the Emile Cousin, cousin solo? So are they good for beginners? Don't know. Don't know. As I said, I don't teach beginners. You know, I really don't teach beginners. So everything I know about beginners would be from Russian books, that one, that ones that anthologies that we used when we were little. That I will know. And I have such an anthology of beginning pieces. Um, and I, as far as I know, that anthology is not being reprinted. Uh, that's, I, mean, I don't know. I just have a Xerox copy of it, uh, which is in PDF form. So I have sent it to several locations around the world <laughs> before. So if you want to have it, I'll send it to you. You just need to email me. Uh, so, But yeah, this is like the beginning from really, really beginning, beginning one-liners, so to speak, in very progressive uh, way to go up without uh, increasing the repertoire too soon, too hard, and going into the reading concerto. It ends up, the first book ends in the reading concerto. Um, Santa with a violin. Hmm. Just a very basic question, if I may please. How to play in tune 100% of the time? Not possible. That's a good answer. 100% of the time, nobody plays. Well, maybe Roman Kim plays. No, even he doesn't. Nobody plays 100% in tune on violin. Of course, it's easier to play 100% in tune something easy that you learn by playing cleanly whatever you're learning. Whatever you're learning, you just don't play. You memorize all the time. You play, you find the first by ear or with tuner's help, and then without tuner, by ear, you have to find it by your own ear. You build intervalically every interval, you know, between open string and first finger, open string and second finger, open string and third finger, then between the fingers, everything is built by ears. Then you can you can check it with the tuner, you know. <laughs> check certain intervals, only perfect intervals with open strings. So again, question about the B. Can you check the B with D open? No, because the D is not open string that gives you an, a perfect interval. It is a sixth. Your perfect B, the good B, is going to be un, in, not in tune with the D open. It shouldn't be. 
So, but it will be very in tune with E open, which is the perfect fourth, which is what it should be. So, so and so forth. So you, you're playing very cleanly everything and you're memorizing how your finger falls, how is your finger curved, how um, your position is, um, releasing the tension. Meanwhile, not to, because we practice intonation, a lot of times we get more tense and then we say, okay, now let go, let go something in the hand, let go, let go, but intonation has to stay. You repeat it. If you have a shift, you memorize where exactly you shift it to, how it feels in the thumb, where your thumb is, where are you? Are you touching the body of the violin in third position or fourth position? Do you touch the shoulder? Uh, with what part of the hand do you touch this and that and that? All of that you memorize. My, minute, minute sensations here and visually as well. You do all of that in the beginning. So lots of memorization going on. That's how you learn. Uh, that will how you will get to play 100% in tune in something easy. When it gets really, really hard, then there's no one person that plays completely in tune in this world. Okay. Um, Michelle, as a teacher, what do you wish that your beginner students would focus on within the first year or two learning? Slow practice, scale digits. Again, as I said before, Michelle, unfortunately, I do not teach beginners to answer this question. But uh, yeah, every student, beginner, uh, beginner or not, near the first uh, first year or two of learning, every year of learning, they have to be playing in tune. Um, yes, we're more lax with uh, the very very beginners if they're young. If they're beginners that are of conscious age, I call them like you know eleven or twelve, and they're beginners. No, they have to be playing very much in tune. If I, I would train, I would get them to train their intonation not on violin necessarily they will sing absolutely they will sing they should be able to repeat that the tune oh i have to transpose because I, I don't have high voice you know that way they should be able to intone their little pieces that you give them they should be able to sing them absolutely to sing them because that develops the ear as well as um, as you know, sightseeing. So, and then when they play, yes, they check with open strings. You can be the open string in lesson and so on, but only on perfect intervals, only in perfect intervals. So that is a hard rule, cannot be broken in anywhere. Um, how fast, they, of course, young kids or like young, young youngsters will not be able to play too fast because it's just hard. So first year, they won't play anything very fast, but they should be probably playing something, you know, by the end of the year, if they're talented and if they're practicing, you know, something like... In all the um, data shares, yeah, they probably will play in this time. So basically they may or may not yet play anything in 16 notes, but probably they'll play in eights. If they can play a, a, a 16 notes already in the end of first, uh, first uh, I mean, you, they, they can be written in 16, but it still will be kind of moderate tempo, you know. So, um, yeah, they could. Again, a, a lot of times uh, a good kind of, you know, again, I'm not using Suzuki and I don't, I don't teach that much of, of you know, beginners at all. But I would say that Playing a reading concerto, first movement of the reading concerto, the end of the first year, after a year of uh, practicing, having a teacher and practicing diligently is a good goal. So is it very fast? No, but it's already moving. So um, uh, John says, thank you for talking about composers that were not violinists. That is so great to hear that. Yes, well, a lot of very good composers that wrote for us, like really great pieces, weren't violinists primarily. You know, so yeah, great pieces learned. Um, Gloria is asking, when you recommend to starting third in playing in third position, um, once a person has good intonation in first position, I will go to second position first. After the first, I'll go into second. I would not go first uh, one, three. I'll go one, two, three. So, but once you start the second, it's all about the ear. It's only all, all about the ear. If the ear 
can hear. So I uh, then you go faster. So for instance, I one time did have a beginner, but she was very, very gifted girl somehow in the left hand and ear was very, very, very good. Just was born that way. So so with her, she didn't shift yet. She didn't, you know, but she played somehow on her own with her father. Her father somehow showed her how to hold the bow. And so the bow hold was terrible. Left hand was better, but still not. We had to organize it. And so to her, I think I gave these pattern scales I was talking about. <laughs> Not in this tempo, it will still be. And back, right, to the A. And then she went to B. I'm not sure, actually, we did B or we did B flat. Maybe we did B flat. So, and then in that position, which is second position, really, but it's the same thing scale. And if necessary, she played them. At first like that, and then slurs with slurs. So she, I put her on those things like within two months. We didn't do yet shifting, any shifting, but she was going so to the first, second, uh, then third on C, and uh, fourth position on D. So that she could hear them well. Once she started hearing very well, and she could hear very well, so then I we added the A flat. A flat at first was hard, and then it became easy, and then we added the I think the B we added also later, and so on. And so in in the, another maybe three weeks after that, she was playing all these scales all through uh, through seventh position, without yet shifting like shifting shifting like making actually. Actually, because here you shift incrementally. Again, this is in my pattern scales video. Please watch it. So that you can do really early, really early, as long as they get good hearing. Um, uh, Sujit is asking, so, Surit, Surit is asking, play, uh, please say something about tenuto. You mean the notation of tenuto? It's not a clear question uh, for me. Tenuto is a notation. It's a little, usually a dash. Uh, tenuto means to play it with more attention to that note, usually. But otherwise, I will have to. It more has to be a little bit more specific question. Um, so, dear Priya, oops. Again, it went, it went, did you go? <laughs> Somewhere here. Uh, so, can you please help me fix the bow jumping on the uh, up on the bow down while going up? Or what going on? I was told uh, was told the hair too tight of the hair, but the. Uh, yeah, so I, I talked about this in the beginning of seminar. I know it's very long, people come and go. So it was in the beginning when I was talking about, it, it's not about uh, it, the tightness of the hair that much. It's about the uh, tilt of the bow, angle of the hair. It has to be a somewhat angled, not flat hair. Uh, usually it alleviates a situation sometimes. It's but also part of that is not to grasp the stick, not to hold the stick very tightly, especially not with a ring finger on your right hand. It just has to be there, but not grab, not press into the string and not press because when the third finger presses into the bow, it actually um, it actually creates a horrible problem with the sound. Okay, when it when it presses with, into the bow like this, and it does a lot of times. So that's when you also will get the bounce in the middle. And this terrible bounce here, you know. Like that dribble kind of thing. It's also, you see, and I, I'm showing you right now, a very jerky bow changes. So in jerky bow changes can be connected to that finger that is pressing or those two fingers pressing, whichever finger, except for the fourth. If fourth is pressing, it will just be lighter. But if uh, any of these one, two or three pressing, they will be getting that tightness and uh, the bow will bounce in the middle because that's what bow likes doing. It likes to dump in the middle. So you need to relax those fingers. You need to let them go to be just passively riding and uh, provide the pressure 
or like now it's not PC to say pressure anymore. It's not politically correct. It's only weight, okay? <laughs> Provide weight. And uh, all pressure has to come from the first finger only. Um, the C brothers, uh, for a six-year-old, have learned for one year violin, third, fifth position, should he follow his previous teacher's style of learning piece by piece fast or spend longer to study one piece for more detail? Uh, I would vary it. If it was piece by piece fast, it's probably, if it's sloppy playing, the playing is really like, you know, you hear that it's sloppy. Uh, intonation is sloppy, it's uh, not very reliable. The sound quality is not very reliable, not very beautiful throughout, not not under control throughout. Then of course, it's a time to get on a piece and to go up until total polish, at least one piece, so that the person knows what the result should be. So I always, uh, I, I well, always, not always, but most often I go to, you know, nice, kind of nice uh, result, uh, end result. So uh, for a young kid, uh, the same person, for a young kid, focus on details and one piece is important or learn more pieces as possible is important. As I just said, it, it has to be varied. It has to be varied. Some things we can go through and, that, and the child has to know that this is right now, we're doing it for speed of learning. And now we're going to polish this piece and really polish it, yeah. Uh, it's it's the same like training, you know, intervallic training and running, right? You 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 run, you you speed up and you slow down, and you don't run, you don't do it the same routine every day, or you change it, right? The same thing here. Oh, Enrique, hello. Uh, let me see the question. Do you have any tips about stage fright? Oh, it's a huge topic. Stage fright is a huge topic. Of course, I have tips. I mean, I do, but right now, actually, we're at two hours now, so I probably, I mean, I won't be able to go into this. Um, but yes, there has to be, I, I mean, I would just look for, let me see if I, if I get the name right. Uh, you know what, I will put the name in the comment section after I check the name. But there is a, uh, a person who I would refer you to for the website, a wonderful website um, uh, that coaches for stage fright. Um, and the main, the stage fright is natural. Number one, it's natural. Uh, everybody gets somewhat up um, for, for the on stage. But the question is if it ruins the performance, if the adrenaline is through the roof, if you can't control your nerves, that's the problematic stage fright. So fright is problematic. And some people just have nervous systems that just cannot handle it. And there, in that case, I do think that uh, there are some uh, interventional methods people use, some, um, some mitigation people can use. And it's absolutely, in my opinion, it, it's if nervous system is such that they cannot do it any other way. I first tried the other ways, every other way. A mental training, um, practice training, all of that, and then if it still bothers, then it's the it's the medical help would be there. Okay, um, and in the nation, so not upon others asking about in the nation, is it all right that students check the pitch in chromatic scales with open strings, mainly thirds? No, not thirds. Mm -mm, I wouldn't, as I said before. Smaller children, no, no, not any, not smaller, not whatever. Let them check with the tuner. I mean, get them the tuner, put this on Pythagorean um, temperament, let them check with the tuner. It's much better than open strings. How to practice sautier, David um, Song, song. Uh, how to practice, I have a video on practicing sautier, I believe, and it's, yeah, I would I would refer you to that now, just because we need to kind of going, finishing, finishing. Uh, it's hard being a guitar player. I, Play some not great with X and the nation, but the bow is a huge number. Oh, you bet. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, please come to India for a short period. I would love to come to India. I hope it will happen. Um, so, uh, Alison, Alston, sorry. Uh, do you recommend that an intermediate student use wrist or arm the brother? As I said in, 
in my wrist vibrato video, I do recommend wrist. I I had so few people in my practice that had a beautiful arm vibrato. Like a good Emanuel had one. He had he used basically arm mostly. But you know, it's very easy to teach arm. It's very hard to undo the tightness in the arm later on. Um, I, Homan is asking, is the Pythagorean tuner the same as a chromatic tuner? No, it's Pythagorean is a temperament. I don't know what exactly, I think chromatic tuners are in, in well-tempered. I think they're well-tempered. Um, so I'm not sure about Daddario. Um, maybe it is, maybe it isn't, you know, but I would go, I really like the, the new, the app on the phone. It's an app on the phone. And I got that app, the total energy, no, to, tonal energy, not total, tonal energy tuner. I got it on the app on the phone. One of my students recommended it to me, one of my good students. And I'm very glad. I mean, I don't use it myself, but I, well, because I trained already without it before, <laughs> But if I want to check something, yes, that's the one I will go to because that's that will be the donation that we use. Uh, what was before, before, um, before the, these apps very precise with different temperaments come around, we had less precise tuners. I think chromatic was there back then. It's an older kind of model of tuning. If I'm not, I may be mistaken. If I'm mistaken, I would apologize. But I think that's it, what it was. And back then, until lately, until I found this Pythagorean temperament that it's available, I would never recommend to use tuners at all. Like they were just, they were just all well tempered. Um, and uh, to continue the streams, love from Canada. Love goes back to Canada. <laughs> I'll try. Soon the school year will start and I will be swamped with my, my existing in-person students here. I have a huge studio. Um, Alston, also, do you have any tips on reducing bouncy balls when playing near the frog? My ball seems to be shaky, bouncy when approaching the frog. Yeah, it means that your, 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 your cushions don't work. Okay, so if it's shaky and bouncy, it means that you're grabbing tight with the fingers with some of them, either these two or the first also, or all three of them, and also the thumb. So that's that's the key. So you have to go for this, this method of playing, staying on the string that way. Um, so um, thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. From Japan, Santo with the violin, you're very welcome. I'm glad to see you from Japan. Michelle, um, adult beginner and with a teacher. Um, I ask about what to focus on the beginning to develop a habit for organized and efficient practice. Yeah, there's so well, of course. I mean, yes, you do need to practice scales. Yes, absolutely. Scales have to go there, arpeggios first to go there, uh, because those are building blocks of any any pieces pretty much. Um, and etudes have to be there and then a piece. So like the like these items, scale, arpeggios, a little small etude and a piece. Or if you're really even before that level, there will be several pieces for different types of intonation, uh, sorry, for different types of technique, using different types of technique. If they're very small, like two lines pieces, uh, then yeah, then ask your teacher. But yes, it's that's what I would do. Um, Anthony, do you have any tips to strengthen the left hand? My, uh, my hand became weaker because of tendonitis. <sighs> Physical therapy would be my best bet is physical therapy, actually. It's not through violin exercises. In violin, you don't want to bang fingers. Uh, playing every day uh, without pain and um, just playing will strengthen it back again. But if you really want to strengthen, go to a very good physical therapist who specializes in hand therapy, not just physical therapy, hand therapy, and ask them how to strengthen your hand. That would be the best. Um, Zenik, um, Dario is not Pythagorean. Oh, thank you so much. It's answering that Dario is not a Pythagorean tuner. Uh, okay, so here we go. So yeah, the Dario, so the, the chromatic tuners are not, and thank you very much for answering that. Um, uh, see, the C brothers, to what degree do you think it, uh, it qualify a young kid to be admitted to pre-college of Juilliard? Have no idea these days. I used to know because I used to, um, send people there. Um, so I don't know what they require now. 
But if you, uh, are, are you in New York? Is that what it is? I mean, you're in the area of New York. You can always go and take a lesson with somebody and see if this, uh, if who, who teaches in Julia Pre College and ask them if this, uh, if your child is ready to go. I will, I, that will be my suggestion. Um, so, wonderful. Oh, Giselle, nice to see you. So, uh, is training on the electrical violin with a headphone a good idea when others are trying to sleep? Yes, probably. Uh huh. Probably. I mean, I've never played um, electrical violin, but why not? Probably. Uh, Natamba is almost game. My right hand is weak. How can I strengthen it too? Well, again, uh, it's quite broad. And uh, what is it weak in your right hand? And I need to know that in order to answer, unfortunately. It's getting late here, uh, and it's getting late here for me, too. So I am going to wrap it up. And uh, just before we go, I want to really recommend to you, just for your enjoyment of and, and, and amazement of all things violin, do find, if you haven't found already, a phenomenal violinist uh, that exists on this planet right now. His name is Roman Kim. Roman, R-O-M-A-N, Roman Kim. <sighs> Out of this world. I mean, he's literally the only one who plays like that. So go find him and be transported into the world of such virtuosity uh, that did not ever exist before. So it's a Paganini of our time for sure, without anything else. Um, you will kidnap. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, yes, and so somebody is writing, yes, um, check Roman Kim's Beethoven Fifth. Beethoven Fifth was the, oh, the latest one. No, check everything about Roman Kim, not just Beethoven Fifth. That's his own arrangement of Beethoven Fifth. But, I mean, check other things. Check what he himself wrote, uh, his own uh, fantasy. Uh, I think it's a fantasy called uh, I, 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 I and the Aria. Uh, he was like 22 years old, and it's uh, it's phenomenal. It's phenomenal. He invented his own uh, technique of um, um, harmonics. No one used it before. So it's amazing. Yeah. So, okay. And, the, oh, you heard somebody heard his violin concerto. Good for you. And, yes, he's also a composer. So that's what makes him so unique. Not only he virtuosically does things that nobody else, I have never seen or, or heard anyone do what he can do. And also, but it's also so musical. It's so captivating. He has a tone. He, it touches your heart when you hear him. It's not just virtuosos. There are many virtuosos, but of course, not many like him virtuosos, but still, maybe virtuosically somebody could do what he does, although I, I doubt it. I mean, he plays fingers, fingered tense. Finger tense. He plays this harmonics that he invented himself. This is amazing. The use of six fingers in Beethoven fifth. Yes, six fingers. So, uh, well, I mean, you mean that he uses thumb as a as a technique, which is Paganini used too. Of course, we know about this. But uh, yeah, it, it's just a man phenomenal. Anyway, so with Roman Kim, we're going to end our stream. I wish you all good night or good morning wherever you are, and. I will sign off here. Bye-bye. Subscribe to my channel if you haven't yet. Okay. <laughs>